We're beginning our New Year's series, message series called Living in Light of the End. Now, what does it mean to live in light of the end? The end of what? Well, we're talking about the end of time, the end of history as we know it. And so to live in light of the end means living our lives here and now, which we're all alive here and now. I assume everybody's alive and breathing here. Our lives here and now, we live those lives in light of eternity, looking to eternity and seeing how eternity is to impact us now. So living in light of the end is thinking about the future. We're not talking about thinking of the end of your life. We're thinking about the end when Jesus returns and keeping that truth in view as we live our lives and prioritize our lives today. Now the verses that I'm going to be talking about today are found in the white page in the middle of your bulletin. I'd encourage you to pull that out. It'll also be up on the screens. It has the outline and the verses as well on the back are some study questions to dig in a little more deeper into the message. The questions are uh, studied in, in the life groups, and you can do them on your own as well. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above not on earthly things. And so in these verses, God's word instructs us to set our hearts and to set our minds on things above, on things in heaven and things of, on things of eternal value. And as we do that, God's going to give us wisdom to live our lives here and now in the very po best possible way that we could possibly live them out, living out God's incredible purposes for our lives in light of eternity. Now, today we're going to be talking about multiplying forever friends. We're going to be talking about how to set priorities in this life regarding forever friends in light of the end. Now, when we think about setting priorities, the next question we have to think about is, what is important? If I were to ask you the question, what is the most important thing in the world, how would you answer? What is the most important thing in the world? Now, in order to answer that question, what's the most important thing in the world, we need to figure out what makes something important. And as I was thinking about it, I was thinking that an important thing, important things are those that are going to last the longest. Now, think about that for a while. Suppose I go down to the 7-Eleven and I want to buy a soda, and I buy the soda, and I drink it, and it's done. That soda... And the overall scheme of things wasn't really very important. It was temporary. I mean, it met a need. I was thirsty. I drank the soda, but it's gone. It's a very temporary, short-lived thing. Now, if I decide to talk to a real estate agent because I'm going to buy a house, that's a bit of a more significant, more important thing because that house that I'm going to live in is going to last a long time. And... Things that are going to be around a long time generally cost more than things that are temporary, don't they? So that house is going to cost a lot more than the soda. And so important things are things that last the longest and things that have the most value. So let's get back to our question. What's the most important thing in the world? It's people. It's people made in God's image. People are not temporary. People are going to last forever. When a person dies, it's not the end of who they are. They're going to exist forever in one of two places, either in heaven or hell. And so this building is not going to last forever. The White House is not going to last forever. The United States of America is not going to last forever. In fact, the Bible tells us this world isn't going to last forever. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth one day. And so people are going to last forever. Not only are people going to last forever, people have great value. Now why does a person have more value, a human being have more value than the spotted owl? Now, some people aren't sure about that, but <laughs> God's Word says that human beings are very valuable, and they're more valuable than animals or anything else that God created, 
because they were created in God's image. You and I have been created in the image of God, and that gives us great value. And not only that, not only have we been made in God's image, but Jesus, the very Son of God, came to this earth and died on the cross for who? For people. Because he loved us so much, because we had such great value to him. And so you are one of the most important things in the world, along with all the other people, because you were created in God's image, and you, every person, has an opportunity to spend eternity with God. That's a mind-boggling thought, isn't it? God wants to spend eternity with people. They're so valuable. He loves them so much. Acts 17.27 says, God did this in the context, uh, it's talking about creating people, so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And so Paul is saying here that the reason God created people was so that they could seek after him and ultimately have a relationship with God. God created people so they would have a relationship with him. And so our top priority in life, every person's top priority in life, is to enter into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's the, by far the most important thing for each one of us. And our next priority has to do with all the other valuable people around us. Now, way back when I was in college a few years ago, uh, I led a small group Bible study. And we named it the Forever Family Fellowship. Forever Family Fellowship. We gave it that name because we realized that as believers, we were part of God's family. The people that were in the small group were Christians. They were saved. We were all part of God's family. And we would be part of God's family forever. Now, many of those people or all of those people I haven't seen for umpteen years. But as believers, one day, I'm going to see them again because we are all part of God's family. You can have all kinds of friends in this life, but only those who are believers are going to be your forever friends. Uh, because at one point, you are going to be separated from one another by death, and only those who are believers in Christ will be reunited in a place called heaven as forever friends. And so today we're going to learn what Jesus had to say about making forever friends. Forever friends are your brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're a believer here this morning, people that you're going to spend eternity with. First principle that Jesus wants us to learn from this story is we need to all learn to set priorities. And so second Sunday in the new year, that's a good time to be talking about setting priorities in our, in our lives. We're going to be talking about a parable that Jesus told. It's called the parable of the shrewd manager. And this parable is confusing to a lot of people. When you read the commentaries, they're all kind of confused at what was Jesus saying. And this parable is confusing to people because they don't know what to make of the manager. Usually in Bible stories, you either say, this is a person you're supposed to emulate their example, or this is a person you're not supposed to emulate their example. But this, this manager... He does some things that he's commended for, and he does some things that aren't so good either. And so what are we to make of this manager? Well, we're going to talk about it. But let me just say at the start that Jesus is using the example of this shrewd manager as we go through this story, this parable, to teach us principles of setting priorities in our life. He's going to teach us principles of setting priorities in our lives. And this manager is not an example for all of us to follow everything he did. Now let's just be clear on that. Don't do everything the manager did. He didn't do everything right. Now, God allows difficulties in our lives sometimes in order to give us an opportunity to reevaluate our priorities in life. Because difficulties make us think. Our story begins in Luke 16, verse 1. Jesus told his disciples... There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. So here we have a manager working for a very rich man. And the manager was not a good manager. 
So we know that from the, from the very beginning, he misused or wasted the resources that the owner or boss had entrusted to him. What does a manager do? He takes the resources uh, of his boss and he's supposed to use them for whose, for whose benefit? For his boss's benefit. And this manager did not do that. He misused and wasted his, uh, his owner's or his boss's resources. And so the boss, the owner, called this manager into his office and he, he asked him for an explanation. Why have you been doing this? But we see it was obvious the owner had already made up his mind and he was going to fire the manager because he had abused his position. He had not correctly and wisely used the resources of this rich man. Now, there's no indication in the story that the manager tried to refute the boss's accusations. We assume he knew he was guilty. He hadn't been doing a good job. He'd been misusing, who knows what he'd been doing with the money, but he had a lack of good stewardship of the boss's resources, and the boss had found out, and he was going to lose his job. Now, when you realize that you've been laid off from a good job and you don't have anything else lined up, I would call that a difficulty. It's a difficulty in life. It makes you think about what you're going to do next. It made this manager think about what his priorities in life were really supposed to be. And he came to the conclusion that relationships are the very most important thing. Let's go on with the story. Verse 3, the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. So I know what I'll do. When I lose my job here, I'll know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. And so the manager reasoned, I'm going to lose my job. I need to have a plan for the future. I really don't want to dig ditches. I'm not a very strong person. You know, I'm in a white-collar job. I just can't dig those ditches. And I, I'm too proud to beg to sit on the street corner and ask for handouts. And so he reasoned that the most important thing in life was his relationships with people. If he had friends, when he lost everything, then his friends would welcome him into their houses and take care of him. And so we'll see the manager came up with a plan to make some new friends. Now, apparently at this point, he didn't have any friends. So he had to make some new friends pretty fast because he was finding out that he's losing a job. Friends who could help him when he was laid off. And so this manager's priorities, as we'll see, were right. Relationships are the most important. Even though the manager's Motives for making friends probably was rather self-serving, but he got it right, what was the most important thing in life. So let's think about ourselves today. Maybe you're going through some difficulty in life. It could be a job situation, just like this manager had a difficulty with a job situation. It could be in financial area. It could be in the area of health. It could be in the area of relationships. It could be any area in your life. Times of difficulty are good times to evaluate your priorities in life. I think about what is the most important thing? How am I going to focus on doing what God wants me to do? Relationships are the most important things in life. Now, they're not the only priority. Obviously, there's other things we have to take care of. But when you have your relationships right, then everything else tends to fall into place. And the first and most important relationship in your life is your relationship with God. The most important relationship in your life is your relationship with God. That should be our top priority in our lives. And if you have that right, your relationship with God is right, then your relationship with people is going to be a whole lot easier when we have our relationship with God correct. So whether you're going through a difficulty right now or not, make God your first priority, and then the other relationships uh, will work out as your second priority this new year. And so today we're going to talk primarily about building relationships with people, but it's going to be in light of our relationship with God informing our other relationships. 
So how do we build relationships or friendships with the people uh, around us, the relationships that God desires? Well, helping others builds relationships. Sometimes I hear people complain, I have no friends. You ever heard somebody complain, I have no friends? And when you talk to people like that, they're just waiting for somebody to come to them, it seems, and announce to them that they're going to be their best friend for, for life. It's been said, and this isn't a Bible verse, but I believe it's a biblical principle. To have a friend, you have to be a friend. In other words, we have to learn to be friends to others in order for others to be friends with us. We need to take the initiative, take the first step to being a friend in order to have friends and friendships with those around us. So how can you be a friend to somebody else? You build relationships with others by helping other people and in order to help others, you need to discover their needs. So we see this put into practice by this manager. Remember this manager? He's thinking about, what am I going to do when I lose this job? It's imminent. It's coming very shortly. I've got to do something quickly. I need friends. I need friends to take care of me when I'm kicked out and on the street. So let's see what he did. So he, that's the manager, called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A, a thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. And so what was the manager doing? He was discovering the needs of his master's debtors. Many of them had huge debts that were a, a great burden upon him, upon, upon them. And here we see two examples. There were many more, I'm sure, that the manager uh, called up and cut their debts. The first owed 800 gallons of olive oil. That's a lot of oil. I don't know exactly how much it was worth, but it was worth a, a lot of money. And he cut what was owed in half from 800 to 400. You think that made the debtor happy? If somebody came to you and said, I'm going to cut your house mortgage in half, that would make you happy, wouldn't it? Or your car payment, or whatever it might be, that would make you very happy with them. The second debtor owed 1,000 bushels of oil. The manager cut off 20%. made it 800. And so the manager, he discovered the needs of others, and he wanted to, he wanted to meet those needs. He took the authority that he had, well, maybe he didn't have the authority, but uh, I don't think the, man, the, the rich man was happy with what he was doing, put it that way, but he did it anyhow because he had, still had the position. Now, what happened? The manager discovered what he had done. He said the manager commended the dishonest manager. So here we get a clue. Don't follow everything this manager did. He was dishonest. But he was commended because he'd acted shrewdly. And then Jesus makes this comment, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. And so I don't believe that what the manager did was right. Uh, he, was, he was reducing people's debts. I don't believe the rich man or the owner had given him the authority to do that. He was losing his master's money, but that's not the point of Jesus' story. The manager or the master commended the dishonest manager because... He'd acted shrewdly. In, in other words, he thought about his predicament. I'm going to lose a job. He came up with a plan, and that plan involved making friends with other people so that when he lost his job, they could take care of him. It was a shrewd plan. And so the manager met the needs of others, made some new friends, and those new friends he expected to meet his needs in the future. It was a shrewd plan plan. Now in the next verses, we're going to see how this applies to believers who are children or people of the light. Now, there are some ways in which we as believers, or even if anyone's here that's not a believer, are like the manager. The manager's boss had entrusted resources to the manager to use. They were not his. They were the boss's resources, and he was to use them wisely. 
God has entrusted many resources to each one of us in our lives. We are to be the stewards or managers of what God has given us. What we have is not our own. All the money that you have in your bank accounts, be it little or much, is not your money. It's God's money. God has entrusted it to you to use for his purposes, to use for him. And Jesus is going to tell us how to use God's money for God's purposes. We are to use God's money to make forever friends. Let's look at verse 9. Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, it refers to the worldly wealth, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now this is Jesus' punchline for the entire parable. This is the point he's striving to drive home. So let me read the verse one more time. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And so Jesus is saying, just as that dishonest manager used money, reducing people's debts, in essence, giving them something, giving them something financial, having their debts paid off, just as the dishonest manager used money to make friends who would welcome him into their homes, who would take care of him, so we are to use money to, to make Forever friends. And how do you make forever friends? We said a forever friend is a believer, somebody who's going to live forever with God in heaven. How do you make forever friends? We make forever friends by leading people to be saved, by being instrumental in people receiving the gift of eternal life. Now, Jesus is talking about an incredible transformation that can happen. Our money, the resources that God has given to us, whether it's in a bank account or tied up in some possessions we own or whatever it may be, that money will be of no use at all to us after we die. You're going to leave it all behind. But in heaven, if you use that worldly wealth that God has entrusted to us to make forever friends in heaven, the results of using that money are going to be there. There's going to be people, and I believe people will know who was instrumental in bringing them to the Lord. They'll understand what part different people played. And so in heaven, we'll be welcomed into our eternal dwellings by our forever friends. And those are people that God has used you to bring to the Lord. And so just as the resources the manager had were those of the master, so our resources that God has entrusted to us, our money is really God's. Every dollar that you have is God's money. And Jesus is saying our money is to be used to make forever friends. He goes on to give us a little more insight into how to manage our, our resources, our money. He says, be faithful with little and you'll be given more. Verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And so Jesus is going on to show us how to use the money that he's entrusted to us. Now, in my experience, most people feel they have too little money. Anybody, well, I won't ask for a raise of hands. But uh, most people feel like they don't have enough. They have too, too little money. And yet, and often they use that as an excuse. I can't do anything. I'm just barely paying my bills. I have too little. God hasn't blessed me with enough money. I'm just barely making it. In fact, I think some recent survey said that I forget 60 or 70% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. If they have an unexpected expense, they do not have any savings in order to take care of it. So people say they don't have enough money. And yet Jesus tells us that if we're faithful to use the little that we have, we'll be trusted with more. If we're not faithful with the little that we have, then God knows he can't trust us. So why should he give us any more? Uh, 
Why should he give us any more? In fact, Jesus says if we're not trustworthy in handling his money, he won't trust us with true riches. So there are riches beyond finances that God wants to bless you with. In this life, true riches, spiritual blessings. There are many things in life that are important, that are not valued in dollars and cents. But God uses as a standard for his evaluation of what we can be trusted with, how we handle worldly wealth, how we handle money. Starting point in God's word and being trustworthy with God's money is, is giving God a tithe or 10% of your income. And the church, how does the church use the money that comes into it? How does a godly church use the money that comes into it? It uses the money that's donated to lead people to Christ, to present the message of the gospel, both here in the St. Louis area and around the world through missions and missionaries that the church supports. And so that money is used to make forever friends. And as we're faithful to put God first in our giving, God blesses our lives, and he helps us to understand that the other 90% is his as well. Does that mean you're supposed to give 100% to the church? No, God isn't saying that at all. God will instruct you how to be faithful with his resources. Some of the money that God entrusts to you, you're going to use to put food on the table. God knows we need to eat. Everybody here need to eat? Yeah. And so God entrusts us with money to put food on our table and feed our families. God entrusts us with resources to put a roof over our head, to put clothes on our back, to put wheels on our cars. But it's God's money. And some we may use in our own way to make forever friends, to bless others, to be a light to others in the world around us. And as we do, we lay up treasure in heaven. We take the worldly wealth that God has entrusted to us and we convert it into something that's going to last forever. Money is temporary. It's not going to last forever, but you can convert it into something that's going to last forever. Treasure in heaven, which I believe the ultimate expression of treasure in heaven is these forever friends who are going to be there to welcome us. And so we serve God. I initially wrote this, serve God with our money, and I changed it, and I, we say we serve God with his money because everything we have is his. Jesus concludes in verse 13. He says, no servant can... Serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So interestingly, Jesus concludes his teaching here in this parable by describing money as a, as a master that you can serve. And so some people try to serve God and do what God wants and serve money as well. And Jesus says it can't be done. You can't serve God and keep control of your money and serve that money rather than just serving him. If we don't recognize that everything we have as far as financial resources is a gift from God, money will become an idol and you will never have enough. And so rather than trying to serve God in money, we must choose to serve God alone. Recognizing all that we have comes from him. It's still his. We are simply managers of or stewards of God's money and resources. So what does Jesus tell us to do with our money? Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves who will welcome you into eternal dwellings. And so this year, let's make it a priority to use what God has given to us to multiply forever friends. Pray over your family budget. Pray over major financial decisions. Ask God how you can use your money to win more people for Jesus. And that includes people in your family. That includes your relatives. That includes people you know at work. That includes your neighbors. Ask God how you can use your resources to extend his kingdom. How can you show God's love the people around you who do not yet know him. God has given each of us worldly wealth, some more, some less, but each one of us has something that can be transformed into 
forever friends in heaven. So let's use it for God's purposes to be a blessing to those around us. And as we do, we're going to lay up treasure in heaven that's going to last forever. So the first question that each one of us has to answer is, are you sure you're going to spend eternity in heaven? Are you sure that you're a believer in Jesus Christ? To become a believer in Jesus Christ, we need to repent and commit our lives to his lordship. We do that by admitting that we've sinned, we've broken God's law, we've done wrong things. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Secondly, we believe that Jesus came, lived a perfect life as the very Son of God, died on the cross, took, his sin, took our sins upon himself that we might be forgiven. He rose from the dead on the third day and he lives today. And we commit our lives to serving the risen Savior as both our Lord and Savior. So let's bow our heads right now. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. If you've never prayed a prayer like this before, if you're not sure you have a relationship with God, if you're not sure you're going to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus, then I'd strongly encourage you to pray this prayer with me, understanding that that would be the most important step you're going to take in your entire life. It does no good to pray this prayer and then go off and live any which way. When you pray this prayer, you're committing your entire life to following Jesus, and you're going to do everything you can to find out what he wants you to do, and then you're going to do it. And so there's no such thing as a 50% commitment as a Christian. You give everything of your life to him, or the transaction is not valid. So let's pray right now. Say, Father, today I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things, things that your word says are wrong, things that I know and my conscience are wrong. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, took my sins upon himself, paid the penalty for my sins, rose from the dead that I might be forgiven. Come into my life through your Holy Spirit. I commit myself to following Jesus as my Lord and Savior all the days of my life, doing everything he tells me to do. I give him 100% of my life 100% of my resources, 100% of all that I am, all that I possess, for him to give me instruction how to use it. In Jesus' name. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray that God would help us to put these principles into practice. Father, today we thank you for this teaching of Jesus, this parable, that's going to help us to set our priorities for the new year to get our lives lined up with your priorities. Help us to make God, help us to make you, our Father, our top priority in life. Drawing closer to you, getting to know you better, understanding what you have for us in the new year, following you more closely. Teach us how to use the money that you've entrusted to us for your purposes to make forever friends. Help us to raise up this priority that you have that it may be a priority in our hearts. Thank you for what you've entrusted to us. Thank you for the little that we have. And help us to be faithful with that so that you can entrust us with greater responsibilities. Empower each one of us, God, we pray, to be used by you to see more people saved in 2015. As the most important thing in life. Use each one of us to do our part to see people we know come to Christ in this new year. May we put you first with the money that you've given us to manage. May we put you first with the time that you've given us. May we put you first with all the resources that you have entrusted to us. And we Believe that as we give to you, as we give to your purposes, first and foremost, that you're going to meet our needs. And you're going to bless us so that we can be a blessing. God, we pray that our church, that Life Church, would multiply forever friends. In 2015, in the St. Louis area and across the world, through the missionaries 
and mission projects that we support. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given to each of us. Help us to be faithful. With all that you've entrusted to us, help us to be good stewards so that one day when we stand before you, we'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your reward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.